turn in your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 4. And as you're getting there, I'd like to welcome all of our live stream people and those who are over in the atrium right now, or if you watch later on social media, welcome. Uh, we're glad that you're with us today, and please feel free to shoot us a message. Let us know who you are, and uh, we'd love to be able to talk to you if you have any questions about our church, or perhaps if you uh, have a spiritual question or need prayer, that we, we do have the monitors that do kind of watch the feed, so you're welcome to do that. We're just glad you're here with us today. Also, if you're here in person, welcome as well. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, just take a minute, if you're a visitor, uh, there's, a, there's a, a little connect tab there in the seat back in front of you to let us know who you are, okay? And what we promise to do is not show up at your house and interrogate you, I promise. We're just here because we care about you. You might get an email or a phone call down the road, but uh, we won't show up at your house, I promise that. Or if it's easier for you, uh, you can, uh, if you like the tech, you know, digital savvy and you want to text the word CONNECT, okay? Text that word CONNECT, capital C-O-N-N-E-C-T to 520-525-2882. That's 520 520- there it is right there, 525-2882. So as I begin this morning, I have a question that has nothing to do with this sermon this morning. I'm just wondering, by a, a nod of your head and let's say a grin, if there is anyone here today that had a difficult time getting at least one of their family members to church or to get them out of their bed this morning. Anybody? Uh, <laughs> Now I'm looking around here. It's not just the parents and the kids. I'm seeing some of our seasoned adults too. How funny is that? No finger pointing, okay, guys? Let's don't do that. So I heard about a mother who was having trouble with her son, her adult son, the very same way. So one Sunday morning, she went in to wake him and tell him, it's time to get up, get ready for church. To which he replied, I'm not going. Why not, she asked. I'll give you three good reasons why I'm not going this, this morning. One, I'm too tired. I wish you wouldn't wake me up so early. Two, no one likes me at that church. And three, I don't like them either. Wow, that's kind of harsh. Of course, you know, when you're in the morning, you're grumpy. You know, sometimes you say things you don't mean, right? So his mother replied, well, I'll give you three good reasons why you should go to church. Number one, you're living under my roof. Ever heard that before, right? Number two, you're 55 years old. <laughs> Wait, it gets better. Number three, you're the pastor. <laughs> oh, that's good, isn't it? Now, get up and get dressed. Get ready to go to church. Now, I should probably qualify that joke here. Um, as your pastor, this is totally not me. Yes, I am 55. But I, I, I absolutely love this church. I look forward to my 5.45 a.m. wake-up call every Sunday morning. I mean, it's a real joy to serve as your pastor. And I just want to say thank you for all the letters of appreciation, all the phone calls and the expressions, the outpouring of your love that you have shown my family and me for this past year. I just want to say, Mountain View, you are such a warm fellowship, and I look forward to the many, 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 many years to come, as God would allow. Amen? All right, since you're clapping, let's all stand in honor of God's Word as we read from the Scripture today. If you're new with us, we always stand in honor of God's Word, and also, you get to read with me, so we do this in partnership together. So we're going to start in verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Are you guys ready? The words are on the screen or in the little worksheet that you have there, okay? Let's start together. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep convictions. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this word, that your word does come to us with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. The word of God. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, your word is precious, and we hold it so high. 
in our hearts and in our lives. And so today, may the words that come out of this book today that are spoken, Lord, be the words that you would have us to share to these people this morning. God, would you just be glorified in everything that's done. May I decrease so you will increase all for the power of the gospel because of the, the one in whom it serves, and that would be Jesus Christ, the one and only, our Son and God, the darling of heaven. We give him all the praise today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. All right, so to start, the power of the gospel, that's what we're going to talk about today. It starts with the special relationship that God has with his church. The power of the gospel starts with that special relationship, write that down in your notes, that God has with his, with his, his church. In verse 4, Paul tells the Thessalonian church that they are loved by God and chosen of him, that is, chosen of God as well. So let's look at the first. There's two important uh, thoughts in that first verse. The first one is that the Thessalonian church is loved by God. Now that literal translation is beloved by God or uh, deeply loved, if you will. Okay? The Greek word is the extension of the word agape. And the way it's used here um, to be beloved is an action that takes place when a condition of another action is met. Got that? The church is beloved by God as a result of what? Their salvation and the outward effects that the Thessalonians church and their believers that changed their lives. So they were going and telling other people about his good news. This term that's used here, the, the agape term, it's a term Paul uses to honor them. So it's a place of great esteem, high praise, and affection. And theologians also agree that verse 4 actually goes with verse 2 and 3 as well, which is this. We read this last week, but I'll read it again. We always thank God for all of you, mention you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you remember from last week, the partnership that Paul had in the gospel with the Thessalonians church is what bonded them together, which is the missionary work that they did side by side. And what does that do? It brings glory. It brings honor. It brings uh, just his affection to the, to the throne room of heaven. Amen, amen church? Lo the Lord loves it when we're in partnership with him together. And guess what? We too bring joy to the heart of God when we are faithful in the work. You see, it's not the laboring that saves us again. Only our faith in Christ is what makes us right with him, okay? And the proof are the good deeds that come out of your life as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Paul says that the Thessalonian church is loved by God, dearly loved by God. Secondly, the Thessalonian church was chosen of God as well. They were chosen of God as well. The word chosen is from the Greek word eklektos, referring to election. Not political, okay? It's not we're talking about a political election, but the election of the doctrine of election of our salvation here, guys. The word itself means the chosen or the called out. Now, Paul's purpose in using eclectos, the chosen of God, is in no way to create a theological firestorm as the word election has become in many of the church, amen? Eclectos was never meant to be exclusive here. Actually, the term is, a, is meant to be a term of endearment to the church. Just as they are loved, they're chosen of God. Why? Because they're partnering with him in the gospel. You see that? Which is... They are loved by God, made right, as I just said, by the relationship they have with God, which brings joy to the heart of God. That's why in verse 6, if you look down in verse 6 in 1 Thessalonians, it says, In spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message of the gospel with joy given by the Holy Spirit. How about that? Now, while the doctrine of election is a major, is, I'm sorry, is not a major theme in the book of Thessalonians, but it is there. Okay, And because of how this doctrine is often misrepresented, especially in today's day and age, it needs to be addressed. So I'm going to address that today. Is your pastor going to find out what I believe about this doctrine? And we need to, first of all, affirm that the doctrine of election is biblical. Jesus says to his disciples in John 15, 16, he says this, 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would bear fruit. Then again, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, uh, the Apostle Paul says that he, God, chose us in himself before the foundation of the world. See, Paul specifically refers to God's chosen, his elect, in the epistles that were written to the churches of Ephesus, to the church at Colossae, and as we'll see here in a minute, uh, the church at Thessalonians, a little bit more in more detail. And then he also wrote to Titus about this same thing as well. That's the first thing. It is biblical. Secondly, the doctrine of election should not be divisive. Write that down. This is very important. I want you to hear this point. The doctrine, doctrine of election should not be divisive. J. Vernon McGee says, the doctrine of election is not to be presented from ours, but from God's side of the ledger. Not your side, but God's side. You and I do not see God's side, nor can we fully understand, I might add, God's side. We can't see it, we can't understand it, as we have never seen him. Thus, election is a mystery. Got that? In other words, God, but you don't. I don't, all right? And it gets really divisive when we sit there and start to split hairs about this doctrine in the church. Meanwhile, the community around us watching us as we're fighting and it shreds us apart. And they're like, you see, that's why I don't believe in, you know, the Bible. I don't believe in God. Because the, the Christians can't even get it right. Because they get so bogged down in the stuff that they're, you know, that we're, we're so heavenly minded. We're no earthly good, in a sense. So we need to be careful. Let's not make this a dividing point. It is biblical. Yes. But it's not worth the, the unity of our church. Amen, church? Third, the question of election is this. This is what you need to know about election. Does God choose sinners to be saved and then provide for their salvation? Or does God provide the way of salvation that sinners must choose for themselves? The answer is what? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. You see, first of all, to the first question, God's knowledge is infinite. We call that the omniscient God. He's the all-knowing God. His power is supreme. That means he is sovereign over everything. He is omnipotent. That's what that means. His strength is perfect. Nobody can outstand God. Nobody. And God is from everlasting, the Bible says, to everlasting, which is he is omnipresent. Now think about it. Just think about this for a minute. How could an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God not have all the details when he transcends both time and space, uh, authority, dominion, and all knowledge, and all um, everlasting to everlasting, omnipresence? How, how, how could that be if he was not sovereign over everything, right? So let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest. How many of you would agree that God is sovereign over everything, everyone, everywhere. Raise your hand. Every hand is up here in this church. Agreed. So yes, God knows who will be saved and therefore provides for our salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Because if he didn't, where would we be? Church, we cannot refuse or refute what Jesus said in John 15, 16. You didn't, I didn't, or you didn't, uh, what does it say? You didn't choose me, I chose you. Okay? Or how about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13? That God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith and in the truth. You hear that? You're chosen from the beginning. That God knew your name even before you were born. Before time started, he knew who you were. You know, John MacArthur wrote a blog on his website a few years ago about the doctrine of election. He says this, God didn't draw straws. He didn't look down the corridor of time to see who would choose him before he decided. Rather, by his sovereign will, he chose who would be in the body of Christ. So to answer the first part of that question, again, he does choose sinners to be saved. And by doing so, God provides for their redemption. Now, here's where I find the doctrine of election so amazing. Right here, okay? In God's sovereignty, not only is he the Lord over everything, but guess what? He chooses to use us, his church, in the work. You know what the word church really means? The called out ones, the elect. How about that? The people we're called to reach. That's the church's responsibility are the whosoever wills. Amen? Think about that. We're the elect, but the people God chooses for us to reach are the whosoever wills will call upon the name of the Lord. Let me explain all this here and make it fit together so you understand it even better, okay? Church, 
That's what the spiritual gifts are all about. That's why God gave them to the church. To what? To build and to edify, okay? To encourage the believers in this room, but also to build the church with the community that's all around us. What Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, he says he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Why? So that the body of Christ can be what? Built up. That's the key right there. There's a reason Jesus calls us to make disciples in Matthew 28, 19. So the body of Christ will be built up. People need the Lord. Paul understood the great commission and spent half his life as a missionary preaching the gospel, doing the work of an evangelist. And that is because God made salvation available to everyone. God did not limit his atonement. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have eternal life. God doesn't want anyone to perish Peter, the apostle says, but for all to come unto repentance. So that leads us to the other side of the equation, which is free will, or some people call it free moral agency. And that is that God has given us the freedom to believe. I agree with this as well, because Paul tells us so as, as much. He says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Then whosoever confesses, like Eugene did this morning, that Jesus is the Son of God, that God abides in him, and he in God. Now, I also want you to notice that both sides, but, or sorry, both of these apostles, John and Paul, not only talk about election, as we read about earlier, I didn't choose, you didn't choose me, I chose you, that's in John, and then, of course, he chose us before the foundation of the world, that's Paul. Now, Paul and John are talking about free moral agency here. So yes, both of these sides can come together and be reconciled, church. See, where I have a problem with the doctrine of free will is this, is that when God's work becomes dependent upon anything that I would do or what, any kind of work that you would do, God doesn't need our work, okay? Remember, when we, let, we, we, we labor, we serve in the power of the Holy Spirit because he's living in us and the good works just naturally come out, supernaturally come out, amen? That's what happens. So here's how these two doctrines align. Simply put, God is sovereign, first of all. He does the saving, period, amen? amen. So when you're sharing the gospel with somebody, it's not your power that's at work, it's God's power working in you. But here's the, here's the equation. When salvation occurs, when God's grace and his forgiveness intersect with our faith, and our repentance or our confession. That's it right there. God's grace and forgiveness, our faith and repentance. Do you see that? I mean, that's how they come together right there, and that's how it works. And the beauty is that the two doctrines can coexist because God is sovereign, and you take away his sovereignty, then it all falls apart. John MacArthur kind of ends this argument very well. He says, how these two sides of God's truth, his sovereignty in choosing us intersect with our responsibility to confess and believe is impossible for us to understand fully. Then he concludes with this. Scripture declares both perspectives of salvation to be true. That's from John MacArthur. It's our duty to acknowledge both and joyfully accept them by faith. Amen? He, got, got, he gets it, okay? It's, if, if you don't have a sovereign God, then none of this makes any sense. Number one, if he's not sovereign, we're not believers because, you know, that means he, he would not be in control. He would not be able to keep the universe in control. Everything would spiral into chaos, wouldn't it? If we don't have a sovereign God who's holy, amen? We need that. So in summary, i just give you this, the doctrine of election. God does the saving and knows who will be saved. Amen? Second, he doesn't need our help, yet he chooses to use us in the work. And third, that everyone under the sound of my voice who cries out that, that Jesus is the Son of God not only can be, but will be saved. Amen? That's it. Let me give you a, kind of an illustration. Kind of put a nice little bow on it and ship this thing down the road, okay? So it's, you're, you're, you're in heaven. Okay? You're about to cross into heaven. The angels are taking you, and Jesus is waiting for you on, uh, at, the, at the pearly gates. So you're walking in, and you see it, how beautiful it is, and you're like, thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Thank you for your salvation, all the wonderful things. 
And as you're walking, you see the gate, and there's a big banner above the gate. You know what it says on that, on that banner? Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever will. And you realize that date when you trusted Jesus, when you admitted that you were a sinner, and you believed Christ, and you accepted him by faith, and you repented of your sins. And then and Jesus is right there with arms open wide. He says, welcome in. Embraces you. It's the happiest day of your life. And as you're walking, you just kind of turn around and take a glance back at the gate. And there's this big banner on the back side of the gate. The same place, at the front side, it just has different wording on it. You know what it says? The elect. Whosoever wills, you're coming in. But until we know, and then it's the elect after we go through the gates. That's how I, that's how I reason this whole argument. Okay? The other part of it, it's a mystery. Only God knows the, the perfect truth in all of this. But I know this, my God's sovereign, and I trust that. Number two, the power of the gospel must be caught and not just taught. The power of the gospel must be caught and not just taught. Verse 5 says this, that our gospel came to you not simply in words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with great conviction. First, the gospel message is more than just words, okay? Now, let me point out that the apostle is not in any way, shape, or form suggesting or minimizing the word of God, and certainly not the gospel message. So he's not lessening that. That's not what we're talking about here. For how could one be saved if it weren't for our scriptures, right? The Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. You see, what I think that Paul is trying to communicate is that the gospel is more than a group of words that are phrased together, spoken in academic belief, okay? It's more than academic belief. And I might add, a recited, pre-rehearsed prayer. You hearing me? If it doesn't come from your heart, it means nothing. If it's just spoken words from your head and academics and knowledge, then you've been deceived. Your salvation is not real. It's not true. It's got to come from inside your heart. W.E. Vine said this in his commentary. The gospel is not merely a statement of fact. The gospel moves the heart and the tongue to expressiveness. The Holy Spirit gives you a new spiritual heart and fills your heart with joy, with love, with peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruits of the Spirit. That's the change in your life. If, you're, if you want to know what, the, when we talk about a changed life, it's because you now have a heart of joy and love and peace and all those other gifts that God gives us. The fruits of the Spirit. And that's because... The reason why you have that is because the gospel is powerful. The gospel message is powerful. You know, while Paul and Silas were in Thessalonica, they were there at least for three weeks. We know they were there three Sabbaths. God had undoubtedly affirmed their message by the demonstrations of his power. Now you're thinking spiritual manifestations and miracles, right? No, 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 no. The fact that God touched and changed their lives that's the power that's the miracle that's the manifestation you know Acts 17 doesn't say that any of these signs came with miracles or supernatural works or anything like that it's it's just amazing you see Paul didn't need to see these spiritual manifestations in order for God to work you see it's God alone who empowers the messenger in the message right it is Jesus' finished work on the cross and the power of the resurrection, the empty grave. That's what transforms our lives, folks. That's where the power comes from. I mean, think of it this way. Mountain View Baptist. When I or somebody preaches the gospel message and teaches the cross and the empty tomb every Sunday, are we not emulating the apostle who was going into the synagogues reasoning the same way? We're emulating. We're, we're doing the same thing they're doing. That is what we're called to do, church. Folks, there's a reason that people are coming to Christ in our church. It's because of the power of the gospel, amen? amen? The miracle is God drawing people to himself and seeing lives and families that are forever changed. That's what brings the excitement and the enthusiasm and the joy. That word enthusiasm means the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit wins. Speaking of the gospel, <clears throat> 
Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, 16 and 17, he says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's a powerful word, isn't it? <laughs> wow. That gives me goosebumps as I preach that. Adrian Rogers once said, it's one of the most powerful quotes that I've ever heard. This is it. He says this, the power of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ is the force by which the gospel cannot be stopped. Say it again. The power of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ is the force by which the gospel cannot be stopped. Come on, let's go, church. Run. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Amen? Amen. That's because the gospel message requires the work of the Holy Spirit. We do not possess the faculties to comprehend and grasp the truth of God's love and how amazing it is without the indwelling, that's Christ living in us, of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit, he pierces the soul with the word of God and brings us to the truth. The Spirit gives us his knowledge so that we can understand and interpret scripture. Praise God for that. We could not be saved if it were not for the work of the Holy Spirit Church. Jesus said in John 16, he says, But I tell you the truth, it is for good that I go away. Unless I go away, the counselor will, or the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you when the spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all the truth. There it is right there. We got to have his work in our lives. The response of the Thessalonians was the result of the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit being poured out over a people with receptive hearts and minds to the gospel. I love Acts 1.8. But you will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witness all around the world. In Jerusalem and Judea and all of Samaria. And to the ends of the earth it says. So we got to have the work of the Holy Spirit. And the, that's the power of the gospel. Number, and the last letter, D. And certainly not least, the gospel message is shared from a heart of deep conviction. The gospel message is to be shared from a heart of deep conviction. You know, the Thessalonians could see in Paul and Silas that their faith was real. They spoke with confidence powered by the Holy Spirit who filled them with his enthusiasm to proclaim with boldness God's good news. Have you ever wondered why Paul worked as hard as he did? Ever wonder that? Because he wanted to make more money, get more famous? Oh, no, of course not. He didn't even ask for pay. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 18, that he preached free of charge. And then in Philippians 4, 19, that he trusted the Lord that God would supply all of his needs according to his riches and glory. Paul worked as hard as he did. Why? Because he had an encounter with the living God on that Damascus road that day that forever changed his life. And there when his spiritual eyes were opened, he came to a realization that what he once believed and what he had done to persecute the Christians was all wrong. He had got it backwards. In that moment of self-awareness, he understood that he had much to be forgiven for all the things that he had done to persecute the church. And like the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with her tears, in Luke chapter 7, when Jesus told her that her sins, which he says are many, just like Paul's sins were many, just like your sins and my sins are many, it says that she was forgiven. When Jesus said he was forgiven, verse 47, you know what it says? She loved much. She had a lot to be forgiven. But then he says those who forgive little is because they love little. They love little because they don't, they don't get it, in other words. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. There's none righteous in this room. We've been forgiven from a lot of stuff. Every person under my voice, including me, have been forgiven of a lot of stuff. And only by grace that we're saved through faith. Right, church? So we need to learn how to love much the way Paul loved much. I mean, this scripture, when, you know, Luke was traveling with Paul on his missionary journeys. You know that, right? And when Luke gets to this point when he tells him this story about this woman... 
bearing her soul before Jesus, melting her tears, wiping her, her hair on his feet after he, she broke her alabaster jar and everything. This must have rocked his world. And that's why he loved much. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 proves this because Paul says the love of Christ, it compels us. That he died for all. That those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That's why he didn't ask for pay like the other traveling philosophers and preachers of the first century who were only interested in making money off of ignorant people. He loved the way that God's love was shown to him, right? Again, I'll say it. When there's much to be forgiven... There's much love to be given as well. Amen, church? And so the deep conviction that Paul had for the Thessalonians came from a message of love and not a debate about academics, which would only include a paycheck at the end of the day. No, Paul loved much because he had been forgiven of much. Before we go today, I want to share a story that will hope hopefully drive this whole sermon home to you. It's a story that I found that was very powerful and made me do a lot of soul searching. It starts out in the early part of the 20th century, a pastor evangelist by the name of Dr. Harry A. Ironside, maybe you've heard of him. He was the pastor at Moody Bible Church after D.L. Moody passed. He was working with an inner city group from the Salvation Army known as the Brethren and on one occasion, the leader asked if Dr. Ironside would give his testimony. He did, giving a powerful word to about 60 men of how God had saved him and changed his life through his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he was speaking, Dr. Ironside noticed that there was a well-dressed man that was uh, sitting in the middle section. And he had, this man had taken out a card from his pocket and had written something on it. As Ironside finished his talk, the man came forward and handed him the card. On one side of the card was his name, which Ironside immediately recognized. The well-dressed man had made a name for himself by lecturing against Christianity and for agnosticism. And on the other side of the card, it read, Sir, I challenge you to a debate. Agnosticism versus Christianity. At the Academy of the science hall next Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. Ironside replied, I will agree to this challenge on the following condition, that in order to prove that you have something worth fighting for, and might I say worth debating about, that you would promise to bring with you, promise to do this, bring with you to the hall of science next Sunday, one person, and with these parameters. You must bring with you a man who was once considered down and out, who for years was under the power of evil habits, which he could not get rid of himself. But when he heard your criticism of the Bible and Christianity, his mind was stirred so deeply that the man went away from the meeting saying, I am now an agnostic. And as a result of this exchange, found new life and power to overcome the problems that he once found himself in by being an agnostic. Then he looked at the gentleman and said, if you promise to bring this one agnostic with you to the Hall of Science at four o'clock next Sunday, I will bring with me 100 men who have lived in such sinful degradation as I have tried to describe, but who have been gloriously saved through believing the very gospel in which you ridicule. I will have these men with me on the platform as witnesses to the miraculous saving power of Jesus Christ and as a present day proof of the truth of the Bible. Then Ironside turned to the Salvation Army captain and said, Captain, do you have any men that could come with me to this meeting next Sunday? The captain said with great enthusiasm, I can give you at least 40 just from our branch of the Salvation Army. And we'll also give you a brass band to lead the procession. <laughs> Excellent, said Ironside. 
Now, sir, I will have no difficulty in picking up 60 others from the various missions, gospel halls, and evangelical churches all across the city. And if you will promise faithfully to bring the one to which I have described the agnostic, then I will come marching in at the head of this procession with the band playing, and I'll be ready for your debate. Well, the man in the well-dressed suit, upon hearing this, his chin just about hit the floor. And with that nervous kind of laugh, he spoke in defeat. He said, it looks like you win, Ironside. And he squirmed himself out of the crowd while the bystanders clapped in celebration. Church, that's the power of the gospel. Amen? You see, the gospel today has the power to set free. The, the power of the gospel has the power to heal somebody of a spiritual cancer in their life. A person set free of the gospel will stop looking at pornography. Someone set free of the gospel will be free of unforgiveness and bitterness in their lives. An individual set free from the gospel will renounce his pride and his selfishness. And a Christ follower like Eugene today will be set free to love God and to love others. And a disciple like you will be set free to spread God's love to the world. That is the power of the gospel. The gospel starts inside of you where the Holy Spirit lives. You see, every one of us have a God-shaped vacuum in us that comes at birth that only God himself can fill. And if he hadn't filled your, your heart, you need to get saved. That's what that means. You're, you're, and then be free to live a life of joy, of love, and peace in your heart and satisfaction because God is in there with you. He's living with you. That's the power of the gospel, folks, that he loves you. Guess what? He wants to save you. Even today, you're watching on live stream, he'll save you too. He'll save you as well in here. If you're in the atrium, it doesn't matter where you are. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. Would you stand with me in prayer? Father, I thank you for the power of the gospel. And I'm not ashamed of it. Because it's the power of God for salvation for everyone to believe. Who believes? To the Jews and all these Gentiles in this room here as well. Lord, <laughs> I just thank you for the fact that, that you sent Paul on these missionary journeys to the rest of the world like us so they could believe too, not just the Jews, but us. Because the gospel's for everyone. Oh God, I just pray for that person that's either watching or in this room today that doesn't, has not experienced the power of the gospel because they're missing the joy that comes from the Lord, the joy that gives us the strength every day. It gets me out of bed at five o'clock in the morning sometimes to just say, hallelujah, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just pray for that person here today that hasn't experienced that joy but knows in their heart they need it. The Bible says if we'll just admit that we're a sinner and repent, that will believe on Christ for his salvation, that he's the son of God that died on the cross and rose again from the dead, confessing him as my Lord and my Savior and asking him to come and receiving him by faith, accepting him in my heart. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so today, if there's somebody here that needs salvation, like I did in 1992, my, my head quit working and my feet started walking down the front, Lord, that's how it happened for me. Maybe there's somebody in this room that needs to put their head to the side and let their heart start to speak for itself. To listen to the Holy Spirit as he's speaking to their heart the conviction of sin. Maybe there's somebody in this room that just needs a fresh start. Somebody struggling in their relationship with you. I don't know what the issue would be, but God, you do. And Father, you're right there. You're just, there, you're just one prayer away from working it out. And bringing forgiveness and reconciliation. If we'll just repent of our sins. And maybe there's somebody in this church that's been looking for a church home. Father, I pray that they'd find the love here at Mountain View. This is the real deal. This is who we are. We're a gospel preaching, Bible believing people of God. Who love our neighbors. And God, if you're calling somebody to our church, Father, let them come. Holy Spirit, whatever the decisions you have for us today, would you just make it very, very real, make it very clear. And Lord, I just give you the praise, knowing that you are in control. So we'll give you this invitation time that we have today for your honor and for your glory today. In Jesus' name, amen.